Hey there, everybody. Welcome to Gather and Go, the podcast that helps you plan, promote, and lead better trips. I'm your host, Brian Jewell. I am really excited that you made some time to join us today. And as always, we're going to do everything we can to make that investment of your time worth your while. Now, today, I'm going to bring you a featured conversation with Ursula Petula Barzi of Moxie Marketing. If you don't know Ursula, well, she is kind of a tourism marketing savant based in London who has so many great ideas about how travel organizations and even mom and pop companies and solopreneurs in the travel space can leverage online content to really boost their visibility and increase sales. You're not going to want to miss that conversation. Before we get there, though, let's start with some travel news you may have missed. The largest cruise liner ever built is preparing for launch. Royal Caribbean accepted delivery of its newest cruise ship, Icon of the Seas, from a shipyard in Finland earlier this week. With 20 decks and weighing in at more than 250,000 metric tons, the Icon of the Seas is the largest passenger ship ever built. According to Royal Caribbean, it took crews 900 days to build the ship, which will have the capacity to carry a record 7,600 guests and 2,350 crew, for a total occupancy just shy of 10,000 people. Icon of the Seas will have eight different neighborhoods for passengers to explore, along with about 40 food and beverage outlets. Other highlights will include a ropes course, seven pools, and the world's largest water park at sea. Now, over the next two months, Royal Caribbean will put the finishing touches on the ship, bring the crew on board, and begin preparing for the inaugural voyage, which is set to depart from Miami on January 27th for a week-long trip around the Caribbean. Well, now it's time for the road tip segment of our show. That's the part of every episode where we dig deep into our bag of travel experience and give you tips that we have found helpful for making travel more smooth and hassle-free and we think will help you as well. You know, when I first started in travel journalism many years ago, uh, I was spending a lot of time on the road, sometimes up to 80 or 100 days a year on the road visiting different states to write articles for our magazine, The Group Travel Leader. And I had a lot of fun doing that. Also had some kind of wild experiences and learned a bunch of things about how to be a better traveler. I want to tell you a story today about one of the wild things that happened to me. I was working on a project on a certain state and the state tourism office had set up a great itinerary for me to visit a half dozen or so destinations in the state over the course of a week to do research for an article. Well, I was about halfway through the trip and I left one city and I don't know, an hour or so later, I pulled into the next city, went to the Convention and Visitors Bureau office where I was set to meet with uh, the lady that ran the office and she was going to take me around and show me her destination for the day. So I got to her office, went in and introduced myself and she brought me uh, into her workspace and had me sit at the desk in front of her and she said, so Brian, how can I help you today? And that's when I realized she did not know why I was there. So I kind of politely said, well, you know, I'm uh, here. I've been working with the state tourism office and I'm working on a magazine article for the group travel leader. And uh, we had planned on you taking me and showing me around town today. And immediately, as soon as I said that, the look on her face, uh, well, it was just priceless. She was so embarrassed. She was so horrified. She had simply forgotten who I was or that I was coming. I think she just saw me as a, a date on her calendar. And frankly, I think she probably thought I was a salesperson there to try to sell her something. Well, as soon as she realized that I was a journalist in town working on a story, she quickly jumped into action. The only problem, though, was she had already made lunch plans for the day. There was a Rotary Club meeting in her town that day, and she had to be at that meeting because if I remember right, she had signed up to lead the national anthem. So what did we do? Well, we got in her car, we went to the Rotary Club, and I had a lovely lunch with some local business people there in town, and she had a lovely voice and led a lovely rendition of the national anthem. And after that, we went out and had a great time exploring her city 
for the rest of the day. Now, I learned a really important lesson that day, and that was whenever I'm out on a multi-day itinerary going to a lot of different places and doing a lot of different things, it's always a good idea to call ahead before I get to a new place just to make sure the people there remember that I am coming. See, if I had called ahead to that town that day, my host uh, would have had some time to orient herself, remember that I was coming, maybe even shuffle her lunch plans a little bit and save herself some embarrassment of sitting in front of me and realizing that she had forgotten who I was and what I was doing there in town. But uh, I started implementing this into my travel routine and I found it super, super helpful. And so these days, if I'm ever out on a trip like that again, anytime I'm headed to a new place where I'm going to be meeting with a new destination representative, I call them, I don't know, an hour or so out, let them know I'm coming, give them my ETA, and just help them remember that I'm on my way. I think this is also a great practice for tour groups, especially if you're out on multi-day tours. You're going from one site to another, from one city to another. It is so helpful to get in the habit of calling ahead and touching base with your contact at whatever attraction or hotel or activity or destination you have coming up next. What are some benefits of calling ahead? Well, here are a few of them. Number one, it's a good reminder to your hosts or partners that you're coming. If you've been in group travel long, you may have been in a situation where you show up with a group of, I don't know, 15 or 25 or 40 people and the folks you're coming to see didn't realize you were going to be there. There was a scheduling snafu, a communications error that can put you in a pinch and it can leave them in a lurch. But if you call ahead 30 minutes, 60 minutes before you get there, it allows a chance to solve those communication problems before they become crises. Number two is it gives your hosts a real life ETA as far as when you're actually going to be there. You know, uh, trips can start to run behind, especially if you have a lot of people on your trip or you have a packed itinerary. And uh, if you are running behind, it's super helpful to your host to let them know when you're going to be there so they can be prepared with um, the guides or the resources or the food or the room keys or whatever it is that they need to make sure that when you do get there, you can move quickly and efficiently and you're not losing more time because the host didn't know when to expect you. Third benefit I love about calling ahead is it gives you a chance to check on any special requests. Uh, let's say you are arriving at a new hotel and a, a couple of your rooms need to be handicap accessible. Well, you could have had that conversation three times with the sales rep at the hotel, but on the day you check in, you want to confirm that with the front desk to make sure the housekeeping staff actually has those rooms available at the same time they have all the other rooms available so that your guests with special needs aren't left waiting an hour or two in the lobby while everyone else is already in their rooms. Same thing applies with restaurants and dietary restrictions, mobility issues at attractions, any special requests. If you've got a special guided tour planned, uh, if you've requested a docent, any kind of special experience, it gives you one last chance 30 to 60 minutes before you arrive to make sure those special requests are on your host radar and they're going to be all squared away when you arrive. And finally, the big benefit of calling ahead is it can expedite things on your arrival. If you have ever uh, arrived at a site or a hotel or a destination, especially at the end of a long ride from the place you were coming from, well, your people are itchy to get off the motor coach. They're probably anxious to get into the facility and use the restroom, uh, excited to sit down and eat, excited to get to their hotel rooms, excited to get started with the activity. The last thing they want is to have to sit on the bus an extra 10 or 15 minutes and wait for you to go check in at the front desk, for you to get the tickets from the box office. Uh, whatever it is that you normally do, if you call ahead, let them know, hey, we're 30 minutes out, we're 15 minutes out, whatever it is, you could probably get those contacts to be waiting for you curbside. In fact, they can step on the motor coach, greet your group, give them an orientation, make them feel extra welcome, and you have a great and efficient experience. So no matter whether you are leading small groups or big groups, as you're moving from place to place, I highly, highly encourage you to call ahead. Save yourself some hassle, maybe save your hosts some embarrassment, and make sure everybody enjoys every moment of their trip. And that is your road tip 
of the week. So before we move on, I want to take a minute and share just a little bit of news from us. As you may know, winter is a busy, busy season for tourism conferences and trade shows. And we are excited to meet as many of you as possible at the many events that we're going to be attending over the next few months. We love getting to know our listeners and readers, finding out what is on your minds, what kind of problems we can help you solve, and uh, other ways that we might be able to help you plan and promote and lead better trips. So I want to give you a rundown of a few of the events that we are going to be at in the next few months. If you are at any of these places, please come find us, come by the booth, come introduce yourself and say hello. We would be thrilled to see you there. Uh, We're going to have a staff member at the USTOA annual conference uh, next week, December 2nd through 6th in Los Angeles. That's a great event for uh, a high-end tour operators network. Uh, In January, we're going to be at the American Bus Association Marketplace. That's January 13th through 16th in Nashville. Please come say hello to us there. Uh, Later on in March, we're going to be at two different events. Select Traveler Conference. That's March 17th through 19th in the Buffalo, Niagara region of New York. And then right after that, Southeast Tourism Society's Domestic Showcase, March 20 through 23rd in Little Rock, Arkansas. And yeah, if you were paying attention to those dates, that is two literal back-to-back conferences in March. Needless to say, our staff's going to be worn out by the end of that time, but we are so excited. Those are two of our favorite events, and we are looking forward to seeing you there. And hey, if you come to the STS Domestic Showcase uh, in Little Rock in March, uh, you get a bonus because... I'm going to be doing a keynote presentation at that event. Super excited about that. You get to hear all new exclusive content that you haven't seen in the magazine or heard on the podcast. Uh, I would love to see you there, meet you, and find out all about what you do and how we can help you do it better. Now, it's just about time for us to get into our featured conversation with Ursula Petula Barty. Before we do, though, let me remind you, you don't need to worry about taking notes because I am taking notes for you. That's right. You can find a wrap up of some of the most important things that Ursula shared in the show notes for this episode. So if you are listening in a podcast playing app, those notes should be in the text right below your player controls. Or if you're listening on our website, uh, those notes are directly below the controls as well in the body of the web page. And hey, after we get to the end of the interview, let me encourage you to hang on for just a couple more minutes, because when we're done, I am going to ask the question, should you rethink your approach to group meals on the road? That's going to be the topic of today's hot minute. You won't want to miss it. We'll be right back with Ursula Petula Barzi. All right, everybody. My guest today is a longtime marketer and content creator who has spent more than 25 years working with organizations large and small. In 2012, she launched Moxie Marketing, a digital marketing agency that works with tourism brands, tour guides, tour operators, and travel associations to increase their website traffic and bring in new customers. She also runs a travel blog called Caribbean and Company that highlights the history, food, and culture of destinations around the Caribbean. Ursula Petula Barzi, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Brian. It's great to be here. I'm so glad to have you with us. You have done so much during your career, and it's always fun to talk to people uh, who have uh, spent a long time doing a lot of things in tourism. But I'm I'm always curious uh, how people like you found your way into tourism work, because it's not a job that many people, you know, select like right when they finish school. So tell me how you got here. Yeah, it it definitely was not on my radar um, at all until um, starting in around 2008, I left my corporate job. I was working for a management uh, consulting firm here in London, and I decided to quit (laughs) in sort of a spur of the moment, crazy kind of, you know, wake up in like the middle of the night, like, what is this for? (laughs) Mm. Um, You know, I was tied to my BlackBerry you know, I didn't have a personal life per se because I was having breakfast, lunch and dinner at 
the job. And I was like, you know, I'm like, yes, I am my ancestors dream, mm. but that's only when it comes to, you know, career and money, you know, mm. the other side was, you know, totally lacking. So I decided to go, um, freelance because I was relatively new to London. Um, I moved here in 2005. Um, I took a transfer with a management, you know, consulting firm that I was working with. And so when I decided to go free freelance, I, I didn't want to go into like another job because I didn't, you know, I was like, uh, so, um, you know, contract work gave me the greatest uh, flexibility. And I did that for a while. And, um, then in, you know, 2012, I was like, okay, you know, I now know the market, you know, enough that I want to do this on my own. And so that's when I launched, um, my, um, you know, marketing firm. And one of my clients was a travel publisher. Mm. And so that was my introduction to the tourism space. They published um, a number of travel magazines, guides. One was focused on, you know, adventure tourism. One was focused on weddings and uh, honeymoons. And my, um, my role with that client was to help them build a new website. So, you know, translating their, their business needs, you know, working with uh, the uh, developer and just helping them build out their marketing um, because they had pretty much just winged it. Mm. <laughs> and so I was like, wow, so this is what I could have done with my degree all along. Oh, it was yeah. very different because I'd primarily worked with, um, you know, banking, finance, um, you know, consulting uh, firms prior. So it was a new world for me. I was like, finally, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I can like enjoy what I'm doing and not just be making money for the sake of, you know, helping these big companies make money. Yeah. Um, but like I'm helping people change their lives because, you know, as you know, um, a lot of the smaller tourism business are family run operations. Um, you know, they maybe have 10, 20 staff members. So it's very much a tight knit group. Mm -hmm. And I love that, um, which is why I was like, OK, I need to I need to dive further into this. So I stuck with it and have expanded. That's amazing. So you you got in uh, a toe into tourism and you discovered not only was a lot more fun than banking, but there was also a sense of purpose. So you've worked with all kinds of organizations in the tourism space. Uh, give us some examples, uh, if you can, of uh, at least the types of organizations uh, that yes. you're working with today. So um, when it comes to the tour operators, you know, on the on the smaller side, um, you know, companies like Guidelines to Britain, they're an, an inbound uh, tour operator. Um, also, um, Miranda's Tours, same thing, you know, inbound uh, tour operator. Um, I've also done work with the European Federation of Tourist Guides, which is an interesting one um, because they have uh, about 30 members, you know, all across Europe. Mm. And so trying to, you know, promote them um, as an organization, but then the individual associations is quite an interesting um, uh, project. And then I also work with the um, Association of Professional Tourist Guides here in London, and they are a group of about 500 Blue Badge tourist guides. Wow. And so while they are a, you know, association, they're very customer focused and they have a, um, you know, commercial site that is focused on, you know, generating leads for their members. Yeah. Um, so that's with something. And one of my new clients is a women's magazine um, who is morphing into a tour operator. Wow. And so that is the moxie work on the Caribbean and Coast side. Um, I worked with probably about half of the, you know, destination um, management organizations um, for countries like Antigua, you know, Montserrat, um, St. Lucia, St. Kitts, St. Vincent, you know, Grenada, Barbados, um, some of the big, you know, hotel brands um, like Sandals Resorts, you know, Royalton, and one of my favorite um, in St. Lucia, Jade Mountain. Um, so a wide variety of, um, you know, brands that I have worked with and coming at it from different angles. So, you know, one, promoting the destination and then, um, you know, also, um, you know, promoting uh, individual, you know, tour businesses. Yeah. Yeah. So have you found any sort of common themes or common challenges that seem to come up uh, over and over in the travel space that clients need your help thinking through or uh, messaging or imaging, anything like that, that comes up over and over? I think the biggest thing is not spending the time 
to do the initial work, you know, road mapping. Okay, based on, you know, these are my products and services. What content do I want to build out, you know, around that so that I can promote that to the best of my ability, not just, um, you know, t- you know, this month, but 12 months throughout the year. Mm-hmm. And that's something that you really have to spend time and do because life gets busy, you know, the busy season comes and you still need to be pushing out content, you know, almost every day. Yeah. Um, with social media now, it's like a beast. You mm. have to feed the beast. <laughs> and so if you don't plan, um, you know, ahead of time, you're going to be left kind of like, oh, you know, frazzled. You know, what do I post? You know, what am I publishing? You know, when do I do? So it's it's just not laying the groundwork Um, Which does take time. But once you get organized, um, you start to get momentum and it's easier to, you know, keep keep up with it. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned content and that's a a word that's uh, on the tip of everybody's tongue these days. Help us uh, wrap our minds around uh, what content means uh, as we look into 2024, um, you know, I'm I'm old enough to remember when it was all about content marketing on your website and, and just blog posts. And then uh, there's all the socials and, you know, TikTok's in the mix now and there's video content and photos. And so where does that travel entrepreneur start thinking about content and what kind of content they should be creating in their marketing efforts? Yeah. So content is the cornerstone of all of your business, you know, no matter what channel you want to focus on. So whether that is email marketing, you know, social media marketing, um, you know, search engine marketing, um, you know, whatever it is, you need content. Mm -hmm. And with that in mind, you know, you have to realize that there are different types of content. You know, would say that there are five different types of uh, content. So one, you know, you want content that is going to educate, um, two, that is going to inspire, three, you know, entertain, um, four, that will uh, convince, and then five, help you uh, convert. So in terms of, you know, content that is going to help, you know, educate people, you know, about your company, about your brand, this could be your corporate pages, it could be blog posts, press releases, you know, ebooks, you know, infographics, travel guides. So a wide variety of different types of content. Then to inspire, that's where your photos and your videos come into play. Um, You might have, uh, you know, influencers that you're working with to, you know, further shine a spotlight on your brand. Then for um, entertainment, you know, you might do events. um, But, you know, from a digital standpoint, um, you might have quizzes, you know, competition, uh, games, things to kind of um, further you know, cause, you know, excitement for your brand. And then in terms of, you know, convincing, so here you want to make sure that you have lots of ratings. So, you know, yes, people are coming to your hotel um, or they're, you know, doing your tours, but if you're not, you you know, collecting those um, reviews, testimonials, it's like, what are you doing? Mm. Um, And so finally, you want to have your, you know, conversion content. So that's your pricing pages. That's your product pages. Um, your sales and landing pages, your lead magnet. So different types of content, but all of them come together to help you uh, position your brand uh, and tell your story to your target audience. Mm, Yeah. So um, that is so helpful Uh, for the solopreneur out there. That's also a huge order to fill, right? So uh, can you give us um, any kind of framework or a roadmap or, you know, anything that, could help somebody sort of say, okay, here's uh, how I handled the first pillar. Here's how I handled the second. Something that makes it, you know, digestible to start putting these things in place. Well, I mean, the first thing is to make sure that your um, content to, um, you know, inform is as robust as possible. So, you know, things about your company, you know, make sure that, you know, you give your company history, um, you showcase your people on your website, you know, you talk about the journey of, you know, how, you know, what, why you started and, you know, with your products and services. So if you're a tour operator and, you know, you sell um, a wide variety of food tours, make sure that the descriptions are robust, um, that you have great imagery, <laughs> mm. you know, and it just, just, so, just so, 
you know, little things can make a huge difference. So focus on your website and just make sure that you do the fundamentals on your website really well, you know, Mm. before you begin to think about, you know, the other channels that you need to work on. Yeah, I love that. So website is step one. Um, I heard you mention email marketing earlier, and that's something that many people really advocate. Uh, If someone wants to use email to market uh, their travel products, what are some best practices in doing that? What are they saying in those emails? Is it still that mix of five content types or can you narrow the focus to one or two content types in that email? Yeah, so based on... um where they are in the journey of of dealing with you as a company. So for example, um, in the first stage, it might be getting them on your email list. Mm. And so there it's just a welcome, you know, great to have you here. And you might follow that up with some of your best content. So some of your, you know, blog posts or articles that really shine a good spotlight on on you know who you are and what you offer. Um, then the next might be, okay, here's our trips, you know, our tours, um, you know, or here's what others like you um, have done in the past with our company. So there's different types of content and you continue that, that along. So when they booked, you know, you send an email thanking them for booking and you set expectations. So if it's a three day tour um, to New York City, um you know, you're going to send them a packing list. You're going to say, here's the itinerary. Here's what to expect with all the details. Um, and then as you get closer, um, you know, 24 hours, you know, we're looking forward to seeing you, you know, here's, you know, final details. And then once you have the weekend, you know, you have a great time, you, you follow that up with another email after the trip, you thank them, you know, you ask for feedback and also a testimonial. So they're, Based on where they are in the journey with you, there are different types of emails that you would send out. You know, and here again, you just have to roadmap it um, based on the customer journey. Yeah, uh, I love that. So not every email needs to be promoting something, right? Some of it's just relationship maintenance, right? Exactly, exactly. Uh, and you should ideally follow the 80-20% rule. So 80% of your content that you're pushing out is the soft sell. Mm. And really 20% is where you go hard on, you know, this is my tours, you know, this is my sales promo offers. And actually you probably should be less than that Um, because too much selling, like hard selling turns people off. Because keep in mind that most often when people see your content, you know, you're interrupting their day. (laughs) Mm. So whether it's opening their you know, email, it might be in the middle of their workday, or even if they're at home, you know, downloading with their, you know, a partner, you're still interrupting their day. So you want it to be a pleasant one. Um, same thing with social media. People are on social media primarily to, um, you know, keep up with our family and friends. And so it's a privilege to be in their feed. Yeah. And so from that standpoint to, you know, if you want to maintain being in their feed, then you need to do the soft sell more often because, you know, particularly with travel, I mean, most people will take um, a few trips per year. So, you know, depending on when they see your content, they may not be in a buying mode. And Mm -hmm. if all they see from you is, you know, tour, tour, buy, 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 or book, 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 you know, this hotel room, then that's going to, that's just going to turn them off. So it, it all goes back to road mapping, you know, yeah. who is your target audience? Um, and be very specific uh, and, you know, create several user personas. So say, for example, you have a tour business in London or, you know, Barcelona, um, and you want to target people on the East Coast of the U.S. And so I'm going to say, OK, you know, I'm looking for a woman named Sally. She is married. You know, she's 32. You know, she has two kids, a husband, and she has a corporate job. That is one particular client that I know I I should target based on others who have booked my products Uh, in the past, like another person could be, um, you know, Susan, who is 60, you know, retired and, 
solo. Um, but she still, you know, enjoys the foodie cultural stuff and she is a go-getter. So, you know, depending on um, who your target audience is, you're going to want to create different types of content, but you have to be consistent with all of it. Yeah. So uh, I, I hear you putting names to some of those customer avatars. That almost seems like a good idea because you, you develop a relationship yes. with this yes. person you've created. Yes. And, and, and so then like every time you create a piece of content, it's like, who is this for? Is this for Sally, Susan or Bob? You know, if you've got three different types of, you know, product ranges or things that you're offering. And like it, if it doesn't fit one of those, then you should not be putting it out there. Mm. That's really, really good, but also really challenging because sometimes in that rush, you're like, well, I got to get content out this week. I'm just going to like fire something off, you know, whatever. Uh, you're saying if it's not targeted towards one of those people and one of those purposes, I'm better off not sending it. Yeah, because it's off message. It's not part of what it is that you're trying to cultivate. Mm -hmm. So that's where it goes back to, okay, you know, let's do the road mapping. Let's see what specific content I need to create. So, okay, I know that in this particular month, I want to try and publish at least two blog posts each week. Um, for each of those blog posts, um, obviously it's going to go on the website, but then there's going to be imagery from that that I could use on social media. You know, maybe I have a video clip um, from one of my tours that kind of relates. That's something on YouTube. Um, but when I post that clip, I will reference this blog post. Mm. So you kind of have to just build it out and weave it all together. It sounds complicated, but it really isn't once you sit down and roadmap it. Say, if not 12 months and at least each quarter, um, you should do that. Yeah, I love that. All right. So you mentioned that it's a privilege to be in somebody's social feed. Uh, and that's absolutely true. Another challenge with social, though, is the algorithm, right? Because you're not the only person and and your your audience is not even determining necessarily whether you show up in their feed. There's this this mystery box of, you know, that's completely opaque uh, that determines how your content gets seen. So for people who are ready to integrate social as part of a content strategy, how do you deal with the uncertainty of the algorithm and, and making sure your content is actually seen by the people who ostensibly want to see your content? So that leads back to your target audience um, and um, making sure that you're first on the platforms that they most are reside. Mm. So if your target audience is younger, then you're definitely going to want to be on Snapchat and TikTok. Mm. You know, but if your audience is, um, you know, people in their 60s plus, you want to be on Facebook hard and, you know, consistent daily. While it's tempting to be on all social media platforms, you don't need to be. Mm. You know, based on your resources, pick one or two and get started. And then as you scale those and as you see success, then you can cross and move on to some of the other platforms. Because with these platforms, you know, as you know, what works uh, today may not work two months from now. Right. And so, you know, because you want to make sure that you're recouping your investment, you kind of have to keep investing time. But again, that goes back to making sure that you're creating content for your audience. Um, so there's no point... Um, you know, running a, a competition that is going to attract people who are not serious you know, about your brand mm. um, to, to, you know, like and follow your page. It's OK to only have, you know, a thousand followers um, or, you know, 10,000, 20,000 followers, because I have worked on, um, you know, social media pages that have that level of fans followers, you know, say 20,000. But. On an annual basis, their content reaches, you know, a million, two million, th three million plus. Wow. And it all goes back to being consistent and posting content that speaks to that audience because they in turn will help you go viral. <laughs> mm. You know, especially if you don't have a budget to run ads against or boost your content, your loyal fans and followers, they will help your content go viral if it's worthy. 
So um, the solopreneurs out there or the, the family businesses that it's, it's literally mom and pop and maybe one or two people helping them, uh, they have to actually operate the tours. They have to do the accounting. They have to make sure the vendors get paid. They've got to yeah, clean the van. I mean, whatever it is. And, and then there's content. So what's the realistic amount of time that um, somebody who's trying to bootstrap or do it themselves uh, should be dedicating to a content strategy, let's say on a weekly basis? So if, if you are a one person you know, operations or one, two person, um, at least, you know, a day of the week should be dedicated to marketing the business. Wow. Um, and, you know, again, it's different types of marketing activity. So it goes back to the different types of content. So, you know, if you're spending three, four days out there doing tours, you definitely need to make sure that once those tours are done, you have a follow-up strategy mm. to get feedback to get the reviews and the testimonials so that those can go on your website um, to then help you bring in the next batch of customers. So that's one type of content. Yeah. You know, then um, um, taking photos and imagery. Okay. Like if the tour starts at 10 o'clock, you better get there at nine and walk around and take some photos mm. so that you have fresh photos that you can then feed into um, your social channels. Mm. So uh, there are some people who are hearing you and saying, it <laughs> might be easier for me to come up with, uh, you know, some extra cash than some extra time for marketing. So at what point does it make sense for that small business to say, uh, we're either going to bring somebody on or outsource some of these content and marketing functions instead of trying to do this when I don't have time or I'm just not good at it? Yeah. So, I mean, as early as possible, if not to bring somebody on board on a weekly, monthly basis, then at least to help you build out the plan. Mm. Because that's often the hard bit. Plus, if you already have an existing website and social media channels, you're going to want to have someone spend some time auditing those mm. um, to see what's working, what's not working. Um, you know, looking at your Google analytics and the analytics for the social media channels that you're on, you know, looking at your email analytics, if you already have email marketing going. And so based on all of that, help you come up with a plan that is realistic um, to then, OK, you know, I can do X and then, you know, maybe I need to hire someone. I mean, I think um, based on a Garnet survey that I recently saw, I mean, most travel brands spend about 10 percent of their revenue on marketing. Mm. So, you know, whatever your revenue is, try and spend 10% of that on some kind of external help. Um, and that might be um, the development of your website. Um, it could be on, you know, search engine, you know, optimization. Um, it could be on, you know, video, which is huge. Mm -hmm. So hiring someone to follow you around on, you know, a few of your tours, um, or come to your hotel or your, you know, whatever your travel business is um, so that you can then have that stock of video that you can use on YouTube or, you know, the other social media channels. Yeah, uh, that's a great tip. Uh, now, the world of technology is changing so fast. Uh, there's automation tools that, you know, didn't exist 10 years ago. Uh, AI is certainly grabbing a lot of headlines. So uh, how do you see some of those tech tools um, shaping or reshaping or streamlining this content and marketing strategy? Yeah, I've been kind of testing BARD and chat GBT. Um, and I think they can be helpful, but in terms of writing content, um, that it's still a big no-no for me. That said, though, the, the technology you know, around them can be very helpful. So if you have a tour business or a hotel business, any kind of travel business, and you have a CRM system, so a customer a relationship management system that has robust data, that could be very helpful to you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, also, if you have an inventory of documents, um, that could that could be very helpful because what you see now on a lot of websites, not just travel websites, is they have a, a chat bot mm -hmm. um, in the bottom right corner. 
So if you're a prospect or a customer, um, if you search around the website, you don't find an answer, you can you know, plug it in there and it will try and you know, find the best answer for you to, you know, whatever your query is. Yeah. Um, sometimes there is like a live person um, who is doing the follow up, you know, if it doesn't find and that could be, you know, an hour, two hours. Um, so that's quite helpful for that technology. Um, also, it can be used to actually help you uh, increase your conversion. So if your CRM is very robust and you have one of these, you know, add-ons uh, to it, um, you can use it to say, okay, based on past prospects and clients, based on what this current prospect is asking for, this is what we should offer them. Mm. So the initial you know, compiling of say an offer, you know, you know, particularly if you offer really customized uh, services, it can help to cut down the time that you spent, you know, putting together our proposals. And then of course you would need, you know, your uh, in-house person or your travel agent or, you know, whoever's doing it to, to uh, check it and make sure that, you know, yep, yeah, that, that hotel matches their requirements or these tours match their requirements. And, Oh, I didn't think of that. So that, is an opportunity or, um, you know, even still, um, you could do personalized, uh, uh marketing based on the AI. Mm. So if it starts to see a pattern, um, you know, within the data of people buying certain things and, and you yourself hadn't even thought of it, it's like, you know, it could prompt you to say, you might want to recommend this to these other people and send out this email. So there are ways that the technology will definitely help to advance the sector. Um, but, you know, you need to have the framework, like your data needs to be, you know, solid. Uh, a lot of small operators now are working from spreadsheets and stuff. So you're going to have to transfer that over to some sort of CRM so that that data could be easily parsed and, uh, you know, you can know, manipulate it. Yeah. Uh, great ideas there. I love that. Uh, now I could keep you all day talking about this stuff. I don't want to do that. I know you have other things to do. Uh, let our listeners know where they can find you, follow you, learn more about uh, maybe working with you. Yes. Yeah, so my main website is um, moxiemarketing.com. So M-O-X-E-E marketing.com. And then if you're interested in going to the Caribbean, you can also check out my Caribbean and co.com. So in you know, a Caribbean, A-N-D-C-O.com. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, before we let you go, we've got some uh, fun questions we ask everybody. And uh, these are no pressure. So uh, just give us the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, when you travel, are you going to book a window seat or an aisle seat? Definitely. Well, going out, definitely a window because mm -hmm. I love to see what I'm flying into from above. And plus, I take a lot of photos and videos. Um, but on the way back, I'll. Yeah, you thought this through. Yeah. So what's uh, something that you carry in your carry on that you wouldn't travel without? Probably my phone, since I take a lot of photos um, with my iPhone. Like I have a big proper camera and I almost never use it these days. It, it's terrible. No, oh, they're so heavy and bulky it's, and phone cameras are so good. It's crazy. Yes, but I invested so much and, you know, the freight, it's just, yeah, it's just too much. Yeah. Yeah. I hear that. So if you had a free airline pass and a week with nothing else to do, where would you be headed next? Um, I probably would go to Ghana. I've mm. never been to Africa um, and it's definitely bucket list. Um, I've been doing some research on my ancestry and um, it links back to the West Coast of Africa. So that definitely would be where I'd want to um, go that I have not. Yeah. Oh, because I've traveled extensively in Europe and you know, North America, et cetera. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. So last question. Uh, what's something you have seen or done on the road that you wish you could go back and experience again with somebody you love? Wow. I think it's probably going to Jade Mountain in St. Lucia. Mm. Um, it is one of the most architecturally striking hotels I have ever seen and stayed in. It's kind of built into a cliff and one of the walls looking out to the ocean is open. 
and you're in your hotel room. There is a infinity pool. <laughs> mm. It's ma- like it was the size of my first apartment in Chicago. <laughs> oh, wow. It was it like, yeah, it was just and just the whole vibe, just, you know, the trees, you know, the birds chirping it was very picturesque. Yeah, it was definitely a positive experience. It's like the only hotel I've been to where I didn't want to leave the hotel room. Yeah, well, that's the testimonial right there. I didn't want to leave the room. What an amazing place. I love that. Ursula, thanks so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Yes, thank you for having me. Well, I sure hope you enjoyed that conversation with Ursula as much as I did. You know, she had a wealth of great insight about an area of your business that's really important, but can also be kind of intimidating. So I want to go through that conversation and just hit a few of the high points that I want to make sure you don't miss because I believe these are going to be really helpful to you in your tourism work. Now, when we were talking about content planning and the importance of having a content roadmap, Ursula said, that's something you really have to spend time and do because life gets busy. The busy season comes, but you still need to be pushing out content almost every single day. If you don't plan ahead of time, you're going to be left frazzled. And she went on to say, once you get organized, you start to get momentum and it's easier to keep up with. Uh, That is a great approach. And she's absolutely right. If you don't prioritize something and systematize it, well, then urgent things that crop up through your day are always going to crowd out the important things that are really going to move your business forward. And that content planning is certainly one of those important things. Now, when we were talking about the ideal content mix, Ursula said you should ideally be following the 80%, 20% rule. So 80% of the content you're pushing out is the soft sell. And 20% is where you go hard on your tours and offers. Because too much hard selling turns people off. Keep in mind that most often when people see your content, you're interrupting their day. So you want it to be pleasant. And she went on to say this about social media feeds. She said, it is a privilege to be in their feed. If you want to maintain being in their feed, you need to do the soft sell more often. I love that approach of saying, hey, it is a privilege to be in someone's feed and it is an interruption to show up in their email inbox throughout the day. So if you recognize those things, it really drives home the importance of making sure that you have earned the privilege and you're continuing to earn the privilege of interrupting their day and showing up in their feed in places they may not have been expecting you. Now, when we were talking about an effective approach to social media, Ursula said, it's tempting to be on all the social media platforms, but you don't need to be. Based on your resources, pick one or two and get started. And then as you scale those and see success, you can move on to some of the other platforms. She said, it's okay to only have a thousand followers. It all goes back to being consistent and posting content that appeals to that audience because they will help you go viral. Boy, I love this approach. Uh, Too many people get caught in the trap of thinking they have to be on every social channel. And so they dabble in each of them, but don't really make any progress in any of them. And I also love uh, her perspective that says you don't have to have a ton of followers. Just serve the followers you have well and post really authentic, really compelling content. And they will take care of making sure that content reaches a wider audience. And finally, when we were talking about what kind of time you should invest in your content creation, Ursula said, if you're a one-person operation, at least a day of the week should be dedicated to marketing the business. If you're spending three or four days out there doing tours, you need to make sure that once those tours are done, you have a follow-up strategy to get feedback, reviews, and testimonials. Well, I'll be honest, uh, this one hurts a little bit because I would assume that many solopreneurs and small businesses in travel find themselves letting this part of their operations slide. But Ursula is exactly right. If you want to make progress in your business, if you want to grow, if you want to scale, if you want to serve more people and make more money, you've got to intentionally invest in getting the message out. And that means having a great content roadmap. Excellent ideas there from Ursula Petula Barzi. 
So I got a question for you. As you're planning your trips for 2024 and you think about how your groups are going to eat on those trips, how are you planning those meals? Well, if you are like most travel planners who have been doing this a while, you might be following the old school playbook for group travel meals. But I happen to think that that playbook is out of date. And that's the topic of today's Hot Minute. Yeah, that's right. The Hot Minute is the portion of the program where I take 60 seconds to give you my unfiltered views on an issue impacting tourism every day. And today we're asking the question, are you doing group meals wrong? So let's put 60 seconds on the clock and get into it. If you come from the old school of trip planning, there's a good chance that when your group sit down for a meal, you limit their menu to three options. Now, I understand why. Uh, This keeps costs under control and helps the restaurant get food out quickly so the group can hurry and get on to its next activity. Today, though, I think that's the wrong way to go. Because if you're a food lover, there's nothing more frustrating than going to a cool restaurant and seeing someone at the table next to you eating something that's not available on your menu. The traditional tour menu is based on moving fast and keeping costs low. But today's groups are smaller, and travelers are in less of a rush, and people are willing to pay more for upgraded experiences. So next time you take a group to a restaurant, try letting them order off the full menu. Because your travelers want choice, and you're smart enough to figure out how to give it to them. That's the hot minute. That's how I see things anyway. Of course, as always, you are welcome to disagree with me, and we can still be friends. And hey, whether you disagree, agree, uh, really, really mad at me, have questions or concerns or ideas, well, I would love to hear from you. You can reach us at podcast at grouptravelleader.com. I read every email that comes into that address. I love hearing your thoughts and ideas. And hey, you never know, uh, your questions or insights or tips might just be the topic of the next hot minute. And hey, while you're in the mood to give us some feedback, would you do me a big favor? Number one, go to your favorite podcast player. And if you haven't already hit the follow button, do that now so that you get the next episode of Gather and Go automatically. And while you're there, would you give us a rating, leave us a review that is super helpful. And I am thankful to everyone who has done that so far. My thanks as well to Ursula Petula Barzi for joining us today on the next episode of Gather and Go. We're going to have a great conversation with Fred Carlson of Sir Vacations, who's going to tell us all about the power of volunteering on the road. You won't want to miss that. Until then, though, remember this. At the end of the day, we're all on this trip together, so... Let's make it a good one. See you next time on Gather and Go. Gather and Go is hosted and executive produced by me, Brian Jewell. Our publisher is Mac Lacey. Danya Simmons is our creative director. Ashley Ricks is our circulation manager and graphic designer. Our sales team is Kyle Anderson and Bryce Wilson. To advertise on the podcast, call Kyle or Bryce at 859-253-0455. Gather and Go is a production of the Group Travel Leader. For more information on our podcast, magazines, and events, visit us online at grouptravelleader.com. Hold up. 